You're listening to Public Reality Radio, WPRR 1680 AM, Ada, 90.1 FM, Clyde Township, 95.3 FM, Grand Rapids, 102.5 FM, Comstock Park, and WPJC 88.3 FM, Pontiac, Illinois. You are now entering Paleo Radio. I'm sorry for that rumble and tumble there at the very beginning. I'm racing around the studio all over the place like a, a chicken with my head cut off, but I'm kind of in a zen moment at the same time, Joe. Oh, yeah? Why Yeah, is it's that? totally true. Well, I had a fantastic weekend, but maybe most importantly is that today is my daughter Teresa's birthday. Ooh, happy birthday, Teresa. Yeah, she turned seven years old today, and just an amazing... Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. She turns eight years old. It's early. Eight, eight years young. <laughs> I need my coffee immediately. <laughs> That's what I said. I said seven years old. I said seven years old, and my wife looks at me, shakes her head, and I say, oh, eight years old. And she goes, no, seven. And I'm like, I did say seven. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my gosh. Go. It's early in the morning. If you'd like to call the show, 616-656-1680. Oh, my gosh. We have a bunch of awesome stuff for you today, Joe. Yeah, we bunch have quite a bunch of stuff for our folks. Quite a lineup. We are going to be talking about four pounds of weed being found. We're going to be talking about Ripped Van Winkle, Google censorship, BBC apologizing for... Uh, Blasphemy, all sorts of good things. We're also going to talk about Samuel Jackson talks about, this is actually something I've wondered for a really long time, uh, is how to deal with the uh, situations on set where you have a love scene and you have a sex scene, right? What's the, how do you do that in a way that's respectful? What's the proper way of even approaching that situation? Well, there's no way. It's it's not going to be awkward, right? I mean, it's definitely <laughs> right. going to be an awkward experience, that's for sure. So he opens up about that. Of course, you've got Maddow and the situation with the taxes and everything else. So we've got, I mean, just tons of stuff. Trump slashing the budget. So, I mean, we've got a lot of these stories to cover and just two hours of tons of fun. We want to thank everyone listening on iTunes and on Spreaker. And actually, you know what? Why not just say it, man? We have stuff in the works, and we'll keep it We'll keep it kind of a little on the down low. We'll just kind of throw crumbs at a time. But you all know, anyone who's listened to the show for any decent amount of time, they know that any time we start talking like this, we deliver. Every time. We, we're like snakes that shed our skin every so often, and we have this kind of new manifestation of ourselves. Yeah, that's very true. Or we're like crabs grow into another shell, right? It gets a little bigger. The world gets a little bigger. We play into it again. Yeah. So we have things kind of behind the scenes specifically for our single largest audience. And our single largest audience is our podcast community. It is. I mean, that's just that's the reality of the situation for any broadcaster. I mean, I'm, I'm serious about this. Name any broadcaster pretty much. You've got broadcasters on big stations and everything else. Their main people listening to their stuff are people who don't listen live. Yes. They listen after the fact. Yeah, they're people that, that, while they listen on their own time, it's kind of like television and TiVo, right? I mean, most people don't sit down and say, my show's on Tuesdays at 7 o'clock. I have to be there to watch it live. A lot of times they record it and watch it when they can. Same is true about radio. Same is true about any media format that we have in audio. So... We're going to be gearing towards our uh, podcast group. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we've got this super amazing thing we're going to wheel out. Actually, we've got a a bunch of stuff that we're going to be wheeling out here in the very, very, very near future. I can kind of see it as I'm just kind of squinting and looking at the horizon line. I can see these things approaching. And super duper duper happy about it, including, and I can just, just flat out say this, the music for our bumpers and intro, that stuff's going like away. Oh yeah. Well, we'll be we'll, we'll be mixing switching. it. It'll in. be our own creation still. But yeah, we'll be changing that up a little bit as we always wanted to do, right? We don't want to stay with the same uh the same music, the same stuff. We're going to toss it up a little bit. Um 
Maybe we'll even let you guys vote on one of our segment uh, songs, one of yeah. our play-ins. We'll figure it out. So we have all these things that we've got in the mix for people, and it's super, super exciting. But I'll tell you, I don't know if it's as exciting, Joe, as this BBC tweet. Yeah, BB- Actually, no, let me take that back. It's way more exciting than this BBC tweet. BBC but. got in a little bit of trouble, though. <laughs> right. They definitely did get in a little bit of trouble. I don't know if they should have, though. It's yeah. interesting. Like, we'll see. You, it's an we'll interesting let you question. Decide. But BBC apologizes for what is the right punishment for blasphemy tweet. So this is uh, BBC Asia, and they have apologized after it was posted, and they posted the question, what is the right punishment for blasphemy mm-hmm. on its Asian network Twitter account? Yeah. Apologies for poorly worded questions from Asian Network today. The question was in context of Pac asking Facebook to help why she would have made that clear. We never intended to yeah. imply that blasphemy should be punished. Provocative question that got it wrong. Yeah, they're saying to help. We should have made that clear. Here's, here's the thing. Why, oh, yes. why apologize for that? I mean, look, what is the right punishment for blasphemy? No, this is a dead serious question to everybody. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm serious. Like, I'm just going to throw it out there right now. What What is the, the right punishment for blasphemy? And I know that there's people in the in the uh, vicinity, right, the area here that this uh, these signals can reach who may believe such things. Right. You have people who are Christians, people who are Muslims, who may believe that there should be certain penalties for blasphemy. And I mean, it may just be ecclesiastical. People might say, well, hey, we don't think you should be part of our church anymore. Yeah, you that, should, that you should could be, be just it. That, that might be it. Book you from the church. But when they're asking about Pakistan, <laughs> when they're asking about that place, you're not talking just like, well, maybe you can't go to the mosque anymore. Yeah. Things yeah. could get a little bit more heated, which is why I think yeah. they, you know, should the BBC be uh, responsible for that? I mean, I think maybe they could have, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe they could have a better uh, context, a better discourse if they're trying to talk about blasphemy laws. No. But, um, yeah, they did kind of leave it a little open-ended, Yeah, what is, is a bit of a worry. I don't know. I, would you publish that question? I know I would. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the, what? In fact, maybe we should. And yes. just say, no apologies. <laughs> what's, yeah. what's the right punishment for blasphemy? It's, it's a valid question. You can just say, well, in my, in my belief, because he, listen, listen, they're actually kind of respecting Islam here. And they are directing this where they are. They're directing this in regards to Islam. And they're asking this question. But they're respecting it because in Islam, they actually take that seriously. Yes. There's entire, like, the way that they talk about this, the, the debates that surround it around the world, like, the laws that are put in place around the world in different countries. This is a, a question that people, this isn't a joke. This is a serious question. I don't know why they apologized other than people go, well, it makes us look bad. Yeah. And you go, well. I think it starts uh, some very difficult discussions, which is why I think yeah. BBC was a little um, worried about it, but... Uh, the interior mis- um, minister, which is Shadri Nassar Ala Khan, said officials in Pakistan and Washington's embassy had approached the two social media companies in an effort to identify Pakistanis, either within the country or abroad, who recently shared material deemed offensive to Islam. Mm. So that that you know kind of brought some different elements into it, but also you have. Certain countries under their blasphemy laws, anyone found to have insulted, uh, insulted Islam or the Prophet Muhammad could be sentenced to death. So that's why I think BBC was a little shaky on it, is perhaps someone could be in danger just for saying that the blasphemy law shouldn't be death. And maybe they would get in some uh, altercation over it. So it could cause some right. some ruffled fe- feathers, but I don't necessarily know if we would have to say that uh, we don't want to tweet it at all. I think that causes a, yeah. more of a stir, right? Well, because, we, we yeah. We have those conversations. Under the country's blasphemy laws, anyone found to have insulted Islam or the Prophet Muhammad can be sentenced to death. Yes. So, I mean, that is, again, like, that didn't just show up out of nowhere, and they're like, well, how did that law come into place? Where did, I didn't realize that was there. Like, no, th- this is... <laughs> <laughs> this is entrenched, man. This is uh, hotly debated. There's a lot of there's a lot of back and forth on. Well, where should the law be about this? What does the Quran say? Th- this is just the way it is. So asking that question is completely legitimate. And you know, this is a real problem. And in fact, um, there are organizations uh, 
that I know of in the secular community, including CFI, right? And I'm a board member uh, for CFI Michigan, just to put it out there. But, um, you know, they have a thing where they bring in people who are bloggers or activists from other countries who are, are seeking asylum because their life is being threatened. Like oh, they yeah. will die. <laughs> yes. These people are being hunted. Right? There is a warrant out for their head. And th- these are real people who th- the, the reason why they're terrified for their life, rightly so, the reason why they're terrified is because there are laws like that. Yes. Well, and because, you know, I think that there is just an overall element where we don't really understand what is going on in the Middle East because we haven't been so close to theocracy in so many years, especially people in the United States. So we have a misinterpreted view of how everything works over there. We have brought this up on the show before, but if someone was to go in and ask someone who's protesting on the streets in a Middle Eastern country, is this a religious protest or a political one, that wouldn't even make sense because it's a theocracy. It's all together. The they don't idea have that dividing line. There is no dividing line. And so when we think about how laws get laid over and how there's a certain, a, at least a certain amount of uh, protectionism to people, that's not there in the Middle East. Reza so, Aslan would disagree, of course. Of course, Reza, yeah, yeah, yes, Reza, Reza Aslan, Aslan would disagree. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yes, and, and of course he would. But there is a, the fact of the matter is there are things like blasphemy laws mm-hmm. that are on the books in Middle Eastern countries still. So why is that? Well, it's because you live in a th- – they're still in a theocracy. You know, it's such a wild thing if you really think about it. I mean it's really d- a dramatic difference in the way that people live. It, if you think about it, we, we're, we come into the station here. We're, we're both uh, atheists, agnostic atheists, however you want to describe it. We, we both reject theism. Okay? We're both, we, don't, we don't subscribe to any kind of uh, superstition or supernaturalism or revelation or anything, anything like that whatsoever. In this country, we woke up with no fear. Right, Get out to the car, drive into the station, hop on a microphone, talk. I have no fear whatsoever that the Christian morality police in Grand Rapids are going to beat in the door here and come nab me and you and go and bring us into prison. That's right. right. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. But if we were over in another country, not only would I be terrified of that, I'd be terrified that anyone around me at any time – might in some way report something that I've said. Oh, yeah. Imagine how that would affect just your day-to-day life. It would change everything. It would change everything about it. It literally would change everything about it. I mean, and that's, that's kind of the point I'm trying to drive home to is what, what early morning radio show in uh, Iraq, <laughs> Afghanistan, or Pakistan is talking about the blasphemy laws uh, right. and just saying, hey, call in, tell us what you think. We should do for punishing people for blasphemy. That's that alone is a violation of the blasphemy laws. You, you know what I mean? And there's just this there's this lack of understanding about how different the the culture is now. And I'm not saying different as in negative, bad, awful, the worst thing ever. I'm saying it's different as in if people want to talk about human rights violations, you need to speak to those groups in a different way than you do about someone who has maybe secular view at their core that says there's a separation of church and state and you can believe what you want, but don't hurt anybody. If someone doesn't have that, that moral view to begin with, you've got to start from a different place. You just can't start from the same place and expect that to, you know, culminate into something valuable. You need to work from where the person is, which is, let me tell you why secular law is better than a theocracy. Hmm. That's point one. Yeah. And you know, I think it's interesting because we've mentioned this on the show many times that people need to recognize and even just appreciate in the West that there is, no matter how religious we are right now, that there is a distinction between the city of God and city of man. Without a doubt. That that in the West, that's that's actually a really valuable thing to have that to have that space, because when you do that, it creates a public space. It creates a place where people go, well, even even most Christian people say, well, there's some stuff that God just simply doesn't care about. Yeah, apparently so. Yeah, well, not for every religion. Yeah, right. Not for every denomination either. I don't want to just paint it like, ah, no. But but 
there's something to this, and I think that people should be grateful. They should recognize what they got. They we'll should be right definitely. Back. 616-656-1680, folks. Call in. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. Back to Eagle and Dragon. Welcome back to Paleo Radio, live in studio. 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, and as always, you can call in, 616-656-1680. All right, we've got a lot of interesting topics. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a whole bunch. Starting with the whole uh, egg yolk thing. This is really, really really important, and I, the timing of this, man, the timing of this is great, and we live in a cool city. I know that people listen all across the nation and all across the world. We have listeners in practically every state. Even in New Zealand, we have we yeah. have international cross country, international all over the place. We got people listening to the show, but where we broadcast live, where, where we're broadcasting from in Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids is a beautiful, beautiful place, and they have a place uh, called Wolfgang's. Oh yes, and I it, it's a breakfast place. You got to check it out. You got to just go online and just check out what it is because it's really cool. But I'm reading this this really uh, important report from the Onion. And it just made me think about it, and I was like, man, this is <laughs> – made me think about Wolfgang's, and I said, man, I'm starving. Report, oh, F, yeah, egg yolk dripping all over sandwich, Sarasota, Florida, saying that the plump liquid center had been broken and was trickling warm yellow goo on all sides. A report released Thursday found that, oh, F, yeah, an egg yolk was dripping all over a sandwich. Says, and that's just it. That's, that's right. And I, immediately, I'm just like, this. we must talk about this, Joe. Yeah, this is some hot news. Hot news. It says, <laughs> oh, baby, just look at that, the report read in part, adding that, hell yes, every ingredient in the sandwich was now soaked in the stuff. <laughs> Amazing. Man, oh, man, it's flowing into the plate now. So tasty. What are the ramifications of this for society, Joe? Oh, what a report. <laughs> what yeah, a report. They, what, what would have happened if they didn't get this report oh. of the sandwich report? Where was this published? Was this in Nature? Uh, it some was, kind of some some dietary. Yeah, it just happened yeah. to be the onion. Oh, it was the onion on this one. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Man, oh, man, it's flowing onto the plate now. So tasty. The report went on to say that a piece of crispy bacon had fallen out of the sandwich oh. and could be dripped into the yolk. That's the that's the dude. I'm serious. Shot. That is the money shot right there at the end. Thank you, Onion, for that early early morning happy ending to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Until it's true. Right there is the happy ending. Just amazing. Uh, an amazing report. I encourage everybody to go check it out over at the Onion report. Big news. Huge news, breaking news, OF, yeah, egg yolk dripping all over sandwich. Almost as big a news, Joe, as someone dropping off almost four pounds of weed at a Goodwill store. Yeah, that is Goodwill. This, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is from Oregon Live. Yeah, the article entitled, Someone Dropped Off Almost Four Pounds of Weed at a Goodwill Store in Kale Williams. Can yeah. you believe that? Yeah, Kale Williams over at the Oregonian... A Goodwill store in Monroe, Washington, got a very generous, though very uh, likely illegal, donation over the weekend. I like that they put likely. <laughs> likely. They're like, it is. Yeah, it's well, kind of up for debate, especially I in Oregon. I, I wondered. I wondered what the laws were about that. Interesting. Uh, well, you can't I mean, carry around pounds of weed. You, you can't I, be dropping off four pounds of weed all over the yeah, place. Man. I'm sure that's still illegal. Yeah, four pounds of weed. Yeah, what, what did they say? They said it was uh, nearly twenty five thousand dollars in a cooler. Wow! Somebody in just walking cooler. around the cooler, twenty five thousand bucks worth of ganj. Look at that! <laughs> and they're willing to give it away. Yeah. Right? Wow! Just anonymously, hey, I'm dropping off some dank. Even <laughs> even if, do you wonder if the person just didn't know what was in there? And if they did, how much is sitting at their house that they didn't even know there were four pounds sitting in a cooler somewhere? What would you do, man? If you, <laughs> Holy cow. Like, how do you – imagine you're the person and you've lost it. I mean I, I lost uh, my wallet before. You know, I, I put it somewhere and misplaced it at a gas station. You know, I'm, I'm using my card and I forget it on the counter, whatever. So I call around. I call maybe the library. Oh, I was there. I was printing something. Oh, yeah, I was over here at the gas station. I'll call these places. How do you call and go, hey, man, 
I may have left a <laughs> thing with like four pounds of some dank weed. Yeah. In your facility, can you just put that behind the counter? And and can you imagine that phone call and somebody being like, uh, "Is there any way that you can identify exactly the content?" And That's be like, exactly uh, right. Yeah, yeah. What would you do? Well, you wouldn't call them. That's what you do. Mm. You'd say you would chalk it up to bad, bad, uh, bad case of luck there. Yeah, if you see somebody kind of walking around the Goodwill dressed up like Carmen San Diego, that's probably the person who's looking for that briefcase full of weed. That's right. And what was it? Oh, no, I'm sorry, it was a cooler. A cooler. Maybe a big briefcase. A big, ig- a big <laughs> igloo cooler. Yeah, big ig- igloo cooler. Just oh, unbelievable. They said it was unclear exactly when the cooler was dropped off or if the person who left it intended to donate the marijuana. <laughs> I doubt it. If they just forgot... Well, it, how do you forget four pounds? That's, that's yeah. what I mean. If you forgot, then forgot that, the cooler you were donating. That person's was fully. house has got to be just covered. You know, part of me, part of me <laughs> says, how can you lose four pounds worth of weed? On the other hand, man, I can imagine being so high that I'd be like, man, I, maybe I, even I, I guess I can't even imagine being that high. No. I mean, you know, I I've been pretty high in my lifetime, and I cannot imagine being so toasted. That I just like, you know, we get in the car and drive off, and they're like, hey, man, where's the, the four pounds of weed? And I'm like, oh, no. I dropped it off in my Goodwill drop off. Yeah, I mean, that's just ridiculous. That's right. You could never be so There's stoned. so many loose ends to this. He story. must have been drunk. Yeah. That's the only way. The alcohol. That is, would have it done. must have been the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Washington law states that adults can purchase and possess up to one ounce. That's like Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. It's yep. like, it's like Michigan. You, you, not. To purchase and possess. That's like, let me take that back. That is Michigan's medical law. You know, if you have a card, you can drive yes, around and have that that's in your not trunk. A, it's not a recreational yeah, law. Yeah, it's not recreational law. Decriminalized in Grand Rapids, though. How much can you have on you in Grand Rapids? Do you know? I do not. Yeah, I don't I'm either. Not, I'm not privy to all the laws. Uh, I know that possession yeah. is a ticket, though, and not a, uh, and not a minor in possession. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know how that works. But, yeah, 3.75 uh, pounds is what this person had, according to Q13 Fox News, around 24000 bucks. Employees at Goodwill were reviewing surveillance footage to try and identify the generous, if misguided, benefactor. Yeah. Well, you know, it's not just that they're reviewing footage to find that person. Like their person might be a criminal. Might, might be in trouble. Might be in big trumps. trouble. Well, especially if old Rip Van Winkle. That's gets, right. <laughs> if old if old Jeff Sessions. Oh, Jeff gets, Sessions. Yeah, yeah, and I love that. I I love the title <laughs> there. This is yeah. a great segue. This goes into. Uh, this is from the American Conservative, and it says Jeff Session is Rip Van Winkle on drug policy. He is. This is by Ted Gallon Carpenter, <laughs> Amcon Mag. Man, I love that though. What a great, what a great title. Yeah. It says lost on the brouhaha about whether G- Attorney General Jeff Sessions lied to Congress about his contact with Russian officials is an appropriate consideration of the pernicious influence he could have on policy towards illegal drugs, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to policy regarding marijuana. Sessions emulates Rip Van Winkle. He apparently went to sleep shortly after Richard Nixon declared a war on illegal drugs in 1971 and just recently awakened from his slumber. <laughs> it says he regurgitates simplistic cliches right out of the 1970s and 1980 about marijuana use. Quote, I don't think America is going to be a better place when people of all ages, and particularly young people, are smoking pot. This is what Sessions has said. Oh. He's also said good people don't smoke marijuana, and he's also said we need grown-ups in Washington to say marijuana is not the kind of thing that ought to be legalized. He called it life-wrecking dis- dependency, adding that marijuana was, quote, only slightly less awful than, um, what, heroin use? Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Yes. He reserved a special contempt for those who argue with growing evidence that marijuana has been useful in weaning opiate addicts off of the harder drugs. So that's his, that's what he really doesn't like is the idea that people have been using marijuana to get uh, off of heroin use and opioids, which is which is the truth. That's been that has been. I'm waiting for him to say, "I dare you to get off drugs. I dare you to I, say no." I'm waiting. I'm just waiting for it, and you know to bring. This guy is, he's just, he's so regressive on the whole thing. And I love how the, the Rip Van Winkle 
It's beautiful. Comparison. And it's perfect. And look, it's it's one of those things. I'm I'm with him to a certain degree, and in fact, I know you are too. In saying that, because uh, you posted on Paleo Radio this week, and in fact, Facebook.com slash Paleo Radio, a reminder, you got to go there. But you posted a thing about how there are studies that have come out that say there are possible cardiovascular problems. Heart issues and heart stroke issues, issues and stroke possibly, issues yeah. possibly with THC. Yeah. And so the idea, there is, there is kind of this thing out there in cannabis culture. And even just on the left, even if people aren't hardcore about weed and they're like they're not big time into Bob Marley and Fish or anything, they just they're they're cool with people who smoke. That there's kind of this thing that says that it's totally safe, man. It's, a it's like e cigs. It's it's yeah, it's totally safe. It has no it has no side effects, has no repercussions, and that's just simply no. not true. It's just like any other substance. It enhances certain things and takes away in other places. That's just that is the game in which we play with all of the substances that we ingest, whether it be juice or different types of sugars or whether it be something like marijuana or THC um, or opioids or opiates, I'm sorry, or anything, uh, muscle relaxers of different kinds. Mm-hmm. So it just is – it goes to show that there's a trade off all the time. Now, on that, on that article, we're not going to get too much into the Facebook post, but basically there's some serious pushback about the credibility of the study. So then I returned back to it and posted – some journal, some peer-reviewed journal entries about cardiovascular issues with frequent marijuana smokers, and still some people didn't like it. Well, that, that's I can understand the sentiment, but the point is, again, when you're on one side, you're not supporting Jeff Sessions just by saying that there are some issues with it either. Right. You're, you're not on that angle. It's not saying, yes, there could be some problems with heavy marijuana use, therefore Jeff Sessions is right, all, all good people – don't smoke. You know, you know, he's he's taken it to an extreme. But at the same time, as much as he wants to say he studied uh the effects of drugs, he really should be studying prohibition. What's what happened to Jack Daniels in the early nineteen hundreds as into what's happened with it today, right? That bottle of Jack Daniels back in the day got people shot up mm-hmm. when it was when we were talking about prohibition. When it was a black market deal and the demand was still high. So we just can't be surprised, right? We can't be surprised that this is the effect of prohibition. Jeff Sessions wants to continue it, but we really need to think of it in a different way. We have a caller on the line. Give us a call, 616-656-1680. We'll be right back right after this with more amazing Paleo Radio. Making the dunes not just a beach, but a biological gem. Current Cast is produced in partnership with Cornell's Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future. Learn more online at currentcast.org. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. We love every single person who checks us out on iTunes and on Spreaker and on every single podcatcher. In fact, there's been a number of people who've reached out to me as of late who's been introducing me to different means that they're finding our show. Yes. <laughs> so, wow, this is, great. Is, this is fascinating. And one of those, and we really ought to say this more. We really ought to say this more. But one of these uh, would be 102.5 FM uh, in this area here. We have a caller, Jim, listening to that very signal uh, in Grand Rapids. Wants to talk about marijuana. What's going on, Jim? Welcome to Paleo Radio. Yes, I'm enjoying your 102.5 new FM station. Yeah. All nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What did you want to yeah. share with us? I wanted to share with you uh, a couple things um, on cannabis usage itself. I, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding why this administration will drag its feet on anything it feels like just because it wants to. And, and a good example of that is stem cell research. Uh, Stuff like that can uh, uh, help people immensely, let alone cure diseases. And uh, cannabis use or marijuana use is, is big also, uh, all the uses. But just getting to the, the, the medical part of it, um, it, it's very important. Now, when, he, when somebody like uh, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions can make a claim of kids on it and stuff like that, uh, any more than alcohol, you, you, you know, you're not supposed to 
uh, when you're uh, at that age. Uh, but one thing I, I wanted to add for everyone to know is uh, on our show, Cut to the Chase, a week from tomorrow, we're going to have Ted Levitt on. Uh, okay. He's a lawyer up in Central Michigan. Actually, you can look him up, Central Michigan Lawyer. And he's a big, big advocate uh, for marijuana, uh, medical, and recreational. And he knows the law inside and out. That's what kind of got me to call you guys is you, you had a few questions on some of the legalities. And uh, this guy seems to know. Now, he does a Sunday morning one-hour program out of central Michigan, I think in the Mount Pleasant area, about 40 miles where Joe and I are from, um, every week, which is amazing up there to do that. Yeah. And my partner, Dave Johnson, uh, lives in Reed City right now and and knows this guy. And uh, he has agreed to come on our show. And... uh, we're probably going to dedicate most of the show. That'd be on the 28th, a week from tomorrow, just on that. And also we're going to have Professor Bonnie Wright, who is a stage four cancer uh, survivor, and talks about uh, using um, medical marijuana in an in a edible or tablet form uh, that's helped uh, her her life immensely and, and maybe partially has helped uh, to save it, too. You know, so, uh, I an expert and a, yeah. and a person who actually needed it desperately, and at the same time, so it should be a good show, Jeremiah. Yeah. All right, yeah. Hey, thank you so much for the phone call, Jim. We especially love it when you call. You're an awesome dude. We love seeing you every time. We don't see you enough. Yeah, and I'd like to uh, if if it works out really well, I'd I'd like to get him on your show too, and uh, the other shows that would have him. Uh, if it turns out to be uh, uh, extremely beneficial, which I really think uh, it is, absolutely, we'll we'll take a look into that. Just uh, talk to us off uh, off air; we can make that happen. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Talk Jim. to you later. Yeah, we'll Thank see you. Ya. And Jim Bye. Jim can contact us the same way that everybody can contact us, and we encourage everyone to do this uh, by emailing Paleo Radio Show at Gmail. Dot com Again, paleoradioshow at gmail.com. And make sure to check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash paleoradio. Check for the verified. So check for the That's check. Right. Check for the check, Check for the baby. check. You know, I'll say this. You know, about the weed stuff, and we can talk about this a little bit longer because this is a big deal. This, and he brings up some stuff about uh, laws and states and stuff like that and sessions and his beliefs about states' rights and things. But there was something said at the very end about weed and cancer. And I'll just say this much. In my opinion, okay, in my opinion, uh, in my uh, reading of of this stuff and studying of it and and speaking with doctors and everything else, it is therapeutic. It's very helpful, right? In fact, it's it's, uh, better than Sativex, Mm -hmm. which would be at least – well, I don't want to say it that way. People people who – need it. Patients tend to prefer to have THC, you know, THC, uh, CBD, whatever the compound, however it's uh, put together in in tablet form or in oil or in flower form or in brownies and edibles and, and different things. They prefer that to the Sativex uh, pill, but it's very helpful during chemo. In fact, it's very helpful during radiation. In fact, they, the studies that have been done say that uh, it can it can help dramatically during radiation. It can help dramatically during chemo with the the effects with things to do with pain, things to do with nausea, things to do with sleep, things to do with eating, things to do with overall general well being. All of these different things, except for getting rid of cancer. That's right, and I mean that bottom of my heart. I and I I I would love to talk to people who disagree with me on this. I would love to have discussions with them on their beliefs regarding the curative qualities of what they believe to be the curative qualities of cannabis uh, regarding not just cancer but any other kind of thing that they say that it can it can heal people of any kind of malady or problem and things like that. I, I would I would very much enjoy that uh, to hear what they have to say. But from all of my studies and all of my readings and things like that on on this matter. Uh, I do not believe that THC uh, or CBD or uh, uh, Rick Simpson oil or any of that stuff. I, I don't believe that it is curative. No, I, no, and I don't think it. I think anyone who's looking at it from a medical standpoint would agree with you that it it isn't that way. We know it's not that way because I think of marijuana more as a 
in kin to a muscle relaxer or something that helps your body cope with pain or maybe get your appetite back or something that is used alongside some some actual medications that are there to to help with a treatment um it's not a cure it doesn't right. it doesn't solve the problems it, in a way it plays i believe it plays the same trick as caffeine does on your brain when you're drinking caffeine your brain is still trying to send signals or your body is still trying to send signals to the brain telling you that you're tired, that you're achy, that you need to sleep. All caffeine is doing is plugging those receptors. It's it's not actually giving you more energy. It's denying the messaging system going from your body to your brain about how you feel. Mm. And that's the same thing that marijuana does. It's the same thing that muscle relaxers do or where they, they're actually allowing the brain – to relax, but that's not solving any issues. So for people with, with certain uh, sicknesses and diseases and the like, people with certain ones where it would be an applicable medication, that may actually be so helpful that it just wipes out a whole bunch of medicines on their shelf. I mean, I've, yeah, I've seen that. I, I have seen that where cannabis wipes out the need for medications ranging from uh, Vicodin, Oxycontin, uh, Valium, anything like that, uh, where those things for people where they may need to be on it for a long time. Yes. Okay. And people look, you have the the situation going on in this country with the, the opiates and people talk about heroin in this country. What's leading to the heroin is a lot of these other medications. Opiate addiction. Opiate addiction. Not a lot of the weed is leading to the heroin. No. And so, I mean, this is a thing they that. Jeff Sessions really needs to study up on. That's the <laughs> he main, just, that's he needs the to main smoke point. a joint, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, that's the main point, though, to show that, you know, we're, we're willing to give some ground, right? You know, there's a reasonable position which says, is marijuana entirely great? Does it do everything good for everybody? No. No, it doesn't. Does it have side effects? Yes. Could, it, could we have an issue legalizing it with people driving inebriated? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, we could. Yeah. Yes, because human beings are stupid. People have to accept that. That's, if people, that if, yes, that could happen. If people, and I've heard, I've heard the argument, and people go, well, no, there will be less accidents because you're so high that you're really worried, and you'll drive better. Mm, and I'm like, what that. a silly, weird argument, man. That's Goofy. I've heard that argument from really stoned people driving. It's pretty close. Oh, no, man, I'm, really, I'm a lot better this way. It's pretty close to I, can, I drive better drunk. Yeah, I mean I, that's a ridiculous okay. thing to say. I've heard people say I that. I know too. it. I have too. But I've heard How a lot wild. I've heard a lot of people say that about being high and they say the reason why is because they're more cautious. They're more, you know, they're kind of paranoid. Well, and they're, I'm like they're slower to react, that's for sure. But the, aren't there studies about people who are paranoid and and the kind of decision making, <laughs> making that they make? It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make good decisions. You're yes. like, "Listen, my baseline is paranoia." That's right. I'll make really I'll drive really well. Yes. I and hey, wow. let's let's get a little personal here. If you're driving in your car and you think that we're bashing marijuana right now, reevaluate your position on what you're thinking about it. And I'm not saying to take ours, but look, our position or my I shouldn't speak for you, my position on it is pretty simple. I think that it can help some certain things. I think it can cause problems in other areas. I think people need to think about it. Overall, it should be legal. People should have the right to choose it and we should regulate it accordingly. But when you're talking about opioid addiction, medically using it, Right. That's where it has an advantage medically that it needs to be acknowledged that you can give people THC or CBD and they don't develop an addiction and they don't develop worse habits for it. And they don't try to get a knockoff street drug to make up for it, Mm -hmm. which is what people do with opiate addiction and heroin. They get on opiates. They lose their medicine. They lose their insurance. It finds out people find out they're overusing it. And then all of a sudden they're off looking for for things like heroin. I mean, it's, it is at epic consideration. Like we need to give serious consideration to the fact that we're having an opiate epidemic right now in our country. It's happening. It's really happening in many rural white areas. And whenever Sessions talks about, well, look at the violence that surrounds it, you go, yes, man. And like you brought up earlier, look at the violence that surrounded prohibition, man. Look at it. Violent. Those, those machine guns, Popping off at each other. This had to do with an illegal trade, man. Yes. Of, of a prohibited substance that people, yeah, and that yeah. now, and people can point to all of the drunk, the, the stuff that with the problems that we have in society that relate to drunkenness. One of the things that we don't have related to the alcohol anymore 
is massive amounts of gang related violence in our streets. Gunshots and gunshots. Brrr, yes. I mean, we're and not the mob, the mob <laughs> running the mob running cities based on the illegal liquor trade. I mean, for real. There's another way of looking at it. This is pretty quick, but it, it, this type of prohibition happens all the time. It even happens with something like prostitution. If you're in Nevada and you work at the Bunny Ranch, you are the government can go in there and audit the Bunny Ranch. They can check the papers. They can make sure everything's on the up and up. They can make sure people are getting tested. They can do all this. If you're on the street, you're looking for a pimp, a guy who can be violent and actually punch and push people around and rip their shirt and and defend you physically. Like think about the difference, and that's that's a difference of policy, not of practice. The same practice is actually going on in both situations. So it's it's only to think about there's a serious element to prohibition and just saying that this is bad, we're not going to work with it at all, or allowing the experiment of states' rights to play a role like we're seeing in marijuana uh, recreational use right now. Mexico, nearly 100,000 people have died fighting over this kind of stuff in the last uh, decade. Jeff Sessions is Rip Van Winkle on drug policy. you got to read it at Amcon Mag. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. Electricians wanted. Visit IBEWMichigan.org. Sponsored by the Michigan Association of Broadcasters and IBEW Michigan. You love to hate them. You hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. If you love Paleo Radio, and we know that you do, Mm -hmm. you can support the show by going to patreon.com backslash paleo radio and donating to us today. The way you can do it is it costs less than a dollar, basically. If you, well, it costs really whatever you want, Jeremiah. It could be just 25 cents. But the kicker is if you pay over a dollar, you get access to some special bonus, super, super cool stuff that only people get. Over a dollar. So you basically got me squeezing my man nipple oh, over here. Over it's this amazing. Just, I'm so excited. There are so many wonderful dreams that come true past that dollar. <laughs> it, it's it's just unbelievable. But we can't tell you about it unless you actually pay in. So, anyways, you got it. You got to do yes. it. You will always get the episodes for free. We always donate. Yeah. We have our episodes for free. But the special content is behind that dollar. Um, if you want to only give 50 cents because you think that's what we're worth, we love you and we thank you for that. So anything you can donate, it's how we keep the show running. And obviously we don't run on sponsorship. We don't want to. We want to run on listener-supported radio. So and our you. good looks. And our good looks. And our good looks. In fact, I have a, apparently, man, meow. Do you know what that is? I do not. M-E-A-W-W, meow. And uh, it's it's a thing on on Facebook. It's one of those what movie icon are you? Oh, okay. What super stud from the eighties? That kind of thing. Well, I was doing a movie icon doppelganger, and I don't do these kind of things very often, but I did one. And instead, I was Tatum Channing. Oh yeah, you're Tatum, huh? Yeah, and I, I was thinking about it, and I was like, it kind of makes sense with my beard. Basically, it's his hair flipped upside down and under my chin. Ah, there you go. Same thing. Upside down. Other than Channing. that, we're identical twins. There you go. <laughs> very, very. So close. Our, our good looks, man. Yeah. I mean, our, our good looks get us uh, get us along day by day, <laughs> <sighs> minute by minute. It's rough. It's, it's rough being so fancy pants. Yes, yes, it is. It's it's terribly rough. What is also rough is mm-hmm. the budget. The budget has been is uh, kind of lame. It's kind of lame. Kind of lame. And it it takes a knock on some. Scientific exploration uh, studies and some programs that I was really excited about that has hurt my little heart. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, we're talking about massive, massive cuts in social programs and massive increase in military spending. Um, There is what's ironic to me, Jeremiah, is the idea that many conservatives are on board with this while not really calling into question how much is not actually getting slashed. It's being transferred. That's that it. Sixty billion dollars is being cut, but fifty-five billion is being reallocated to the military. Mm-hmm. So a five billion dollar cut in the budget. But I mean, that budget's not going anywhere. No, that budget. No, way. <laughs> that budget no ain't, ain't way. moving. Ain't moving. You no. know, it's it's one of these things. I it's it's posturing. Absolutely, it's, it's it messaging. Is. It's saying, and there's a point to it to say he promised a bunch of stuff. I mean, during during the campaign, he, you know, he said he was going to do this, he, sure he was going to do that, 
And even if it doesn't get through, and you know it's not, but the fact that he put that out there and said, hey, this would be my budget, and puts it out there, everybody can go, whoa, that's crazy town, and say some of this stuff is just nuts, some of it's debatable, some of it's bonker town, uh, and then you say, you know, what? where are we going now in reality? <laughs> like, where? which direction are we going to go? Are we going to raise the amount of money that we give to certain programs? Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it plays we'll out. I mean, it's Republicans in charge. They're not going to want to give money to a lot of the no. programs we're talking they're, about. They're going to – they were – About science. I think they're going to gut a lot of the agencies that people are in the head of. I mean, the way that he's put people into certain agencies, many of them, their number one goal before they got there was to reduce or weaken those agencies themselves. Like, for instance, Betsy DeVos is a perfect, perfect example – Betsy DeVos doesn't want to have a big Department of Education that's not going to allow funding to go towards people that aren't involved in federal education. She wants that funding to go to them with without the same standards to get the money. So, I mean, basically, in a sense, she wants to reduce the Department of Education. Mm-hmm. She wants to take the money from it, but she doesn't want the rules. Well, what is that? Right. That's that's reducing the program. <laughs> and and there's people all across the board. Now, it, are they going to shut down the programs? No, but they can gut them. They can absolutely gut them. His first budget proposal, which he named America First, a budget blueprint to make America great again, would increase defense spending by fifty four billion dollars. <sighs> and then and let's just pause that for a second. When we're talking about raising increasing the amount of money for this. We're talking about, I don't know if any of you have seen the charts that lay it out on how much we spend compared to how much other countries spend. It looks like a joke. It it actually looks like, it it is a joke, yes. But visually, when you see it, you go, wow. Like, that's a startling thing. And then you, you see how many other countries would you have to slam together and kind of smush and create into this this crazy freak thing that would have as much money invested into the military as us. You're talking a bunch of countries. It'd take at least three first world countries combined. At to, least to three. Match us. Any three you guys want. At least three. Any three we could pick. Yeah. It would take three of Pick them. Pick any around the globe. Doesn't matter. Budget. Mix and match. Have yep. fun. Find them out. Seek them out. All the all the big scaries that we can possibly think of. Any any of them. The big threats that are overseas. You know me. You know I talk. I, I've talked and discussed about my worries with Russia. Russia doesn't even come close. Doesn't even come close to the military power that we have. But a lot of our military is tied up in not being very efficient and is tied up in contracts. The same way people know this, people know how this works. If you worked at a school even and you are given a $10,000 budget, this is a dream world, by the way, absolute dream world, $10,000 budget to run a classroom doesn't happen. But let's say you get ten grand and it's going to be uh, to run the class or better yet, $1,000. You're going to get $1,000 to buy supplies and you only buy $850 worth of supplies. Now, you know that you need to spend that other 150 or the next year. What are they going to do? They're going to give you $850. If you don't spend the surplus, you're going to lose it. Well, m- the military industrial complex is the same exact way and it pays out the same exact way where there's a lot of people that have bought in and yes, we don't need 400 more tanks, but we're going to get the 400 more tanks because they know next year, if we don't, we're going to lose this order. And it's, it's a, it's a shell game. It's a game about just pushing a product that's not really even needed. And then on top of that, not to get too much into the rabbit hole, but once the military stops taking those weapons, then the police starts taking those weapons and they start selling military grade weaponry to police stations. And it's it it's a bleeding effect, and we have that problem. But going back to the science budget, I, I know that's kind of neither here nor there. It's just the idea that we have a huge issue with a, a bloated military already. The idea of allocating Massive. fifty billion more dollars to it is just trippy. Massive. You've got a twenty a twenty percent reduction of funds that would go to agriculture, labor, state departments. More than 30% at the Environmental Protection Agency. It would also propose eliminating future federal support for the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the uh, 
Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So, yeah, going yeah. after things like PBC, you know, come on, or PBS. PBS, yeah. You know, why? Well, well I mean, and there's the thing. Like, people, there's a difference of philosophical opinion regarding what the federal government should should fund. And people can look and say, I, I know a lot of people who say, well, who wouldn't question that and say, well, my philosophy is that if it proves to be beneficial to X number of people, then we it's a good program, right? That that's, the, that's their model, their philosophy of, of what, they're, what warrants a program getting money or even existing. There are people who just don't buy that. That's not their philosophy. I understand that. And they just sure. say, well, and so when those people run – they get in a place and they say, hey, I, I don't think that we should, we should fund certain programs to, to this extent. It's going to create a problem. Sure. I mean, there, there are, there's going to be – there's a price tag for that. <laughs> sure. You know, and that's where the debate is. You know, but I've, I've heard this for a long time. I mean, I, I remember go, going back – was it Piss Christ? What was it uh, years and years ago, man, the picture of uh, Jesus in urine? Like pig urine. I don't remember. It was old school. And I think that was a National Endowment of the Arts. Correct me if I'm wrong. 616-656-1680. And we'd love to hear your opinion on this stuff. You know, but with the the EPA alone, 50 programs, 3,200 positions would be eliminated. And what is – And people – Does the government not have a responsibility to protect the – protect the uh, environment? Well, that's what they would say is they would say that – they would say the federal government, no. They might say, well, does does the state have a responsibility? They could say, yes, the state would have responsibility. At what level does the state have responsibility? And they would say, what happens if we say both? Because I would say both. I would say federal government and state Ab- government. Absolutely. Both. That would be my yeah. take, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then someone could argue, well, what, what about situations where e- EPA abuses? And this is going to happen with any agency. This is yes. any bureaucratic yeah. agency, right? And this is part of their argument, too. What happens um, when it gets abusive? Yeah, it's better you know, to be abusive on the end of preserving than abusive on the end of taking advantage of the nature. That's the answer. Is yeah. that, yes, for every farmer that has to pay an extra grand to dig the ditch an extra 50 feet— you're better off having that guy dig the ditch than to say you can dump your crap anywhere. I think it's a debate over means. You know, like when people say, well, and I hear so, – some of my friends will say stuff like um, – and, and people on the left will say things like, you know, conservatives, they just want, you know, dirty air, dirty water. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've never met – and I've, I've met a lot of crazy conservative people. I've met a lot of them, dude, just complete loon tunes. Uh, never one time if, one, if any of them said, "Do what we need for our children is that dirty air and dirty water." Yeah, but they like also we, uh, we want that. But they their idea for how we can accomplish getting clean water, I don't buy that line. Yeah, it's right. A, but that's the, yeah. that's the philosophy. It's impossible. It's impossible. It, if you're relying on volunteerism, then there shouldn't be a re, we shouldn't even see the problem, right? If we see the volunteerism, you should we wouldn't have a problem in the first place. If volunteerism solved those problems. Government wouldn't be needed. You would have everyone already cleaning the air. You wouldn't need a law. I know we've got some libertarians listening who would disagree with that. Call us 616 656 1680 to give us your opinion. We'd love to hear from you. We got another hour of our show coming up. Don't go anywhere. More Paleo Radio right after this. Climate Connections is produced by the Yale Center for Environmental Communication. Learn more at YaleClimateConnections.org. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Welcome back to our number two of Paleo Radio, live in studio here at WPRR, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, and also 102.5 FM. We have a litany of FM stations now that we're airing here in the greater Grand Rapids area. So thank you, folks, and thank you for tuning in and listening on Spreaker. We love you guys, and you are the mold or the glue that holds us together. You're the backbone, literally. That's All true. of the podcast uh, audience that we have, you are the heartbeat of this thing. That's right. You are the steam in our engine, literally. 
and we love every single one of you, but we want to connect better with you. And actually, we were talking about this, and I was kind of throwing stuff out to even my wife and other people, just saying, like, how, how can we better connect in a way, you know, with people? We don't do – we haven't to date yet done, like, a live uh, podcast online. Yes. Where people can join in in a comment section. And we want right. to do that. We and we want to do that. Yes. And that's, sure. yeah, keep your, keep your eyes peeled. So the, this sort of thing, uh, to create a community, a sense, of, uh, a sense of belonging, to say, what is it about the show, you know, that, that drives people here? And a guy messaged me yesterday out of the blue. I haven't talked to this guy in like years. He messaged me out of the blue and he said, hey, man, he said, I just want to let you know. He said, you got a really unique voice. And I, I, I'll take that as a compliment, right? Yeah, that's and a good he, thing. And he said, you know, he loves the show. And so we got talking about the show. So I asked about the show. And I, you know, and he said he loves the show uh, because there is a, a tone of respect. He said, you guys are hilarious. You're funny. You guys will disagree. But there's respect to, not only with each other, but there's respect to people outside the group, people listening who will disagree with you. And this guy does on a bunch of stuff. But yet he doesn't feel as though... We we have ill will that we are disrespectful uh, in a way that's unnecessary. And he goes and that and, you know, that's I don't know how much of a, a commercial <laughs> selling point that is. You know, people like the back and forth, the brouhaha, you know, of the uh, of the the boiling kettle. Right. Yeah. They, they like that. But at the same time, it's just a question to say, what do we what how do we. Better connect with people. And there are a number of ways that people can do it. Facebook.com slash Paleo Radio. That's one way. Twitter.com slash Paleo Radio Show. Our iTunes and Spreaker, of course. And we encourage reviews all the time. Yes. And lastly, our email. And and I I say this all the time. Uh, You know, we put this at the end of videos we make. And we say for appearances, you know, debates and interviews. We would love to participate in this sort of thing. There was... um. There was an event a couple years ago that I went to. I was filling in for Justin Schieber at Ferris State. It was the first time I went to Ferris. Mm-hmm. And Bible Reloaded, the guys from Bible Reloaded were there. Yeah. And they were the moderators of that. Of, it wasn't a debate. It was a panel, panel discussion. But they were the ones moderating. And I thought, and I said, I would love to do we that with do Joe. That, we, for sure. we should do that. Yes. I would love to do that. And let me just say this. I know for a fact, I know it for a fact. There's a whole bunch of, uh, of secular podcasters who listen to this show and don't agree with what we're saying. We know it. We know it. I, I, I already know it. You've talked to me. And, and other ones, you don't have to. We already just know, mm-hmm. right? The thing is, debate us. We yes. know you disagree with our positions. Debate us. We put it out there. Said if you'd like to debate, paleo radio show at gmail.com. Yeah, we have a wide range of things that we're willing to debate on. And, yeah, we want to get out there a little bit more. We want to be more involved. But one thing that you guys can do to be involved with us is, like we were talking about, there's also Patreon. But say you don't want to make a financial donation of any sort, you know you don't have to. You can go and support us on our social media just by liking our Facebook page that helps us out in a way that you couldn't even imagine. Going on and writing a positive review on iTunes. These are small things that can really help us get go forward. But as we do move forward, yes, we want to be in the public sphere more. We want to do more debates. We want to invite people in and have these uh, hard discussions. Like we're talking about the punishments for blasphemy. We want to have that debate and that conversation. We want to talk about these sort of things. Um, we want to talk about about all sorts of issues, transgender issues. We want to talk about uh, theological problems. There, there's many different arguments and philosophies that we can take and many yeah. that we'd like to debate. Well, and as I said, just the content of the show, right? The content of the show, we already know. We already know that there's a lot of people who listen to the program uh, who disagree with us, thought leaders, people who are, you know, kingmakers, gatekeepers, your 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 grand poobahs. Your grand uh, poobahs. We and the thing is, and here's the thing: we a lot of our listeners will listen to other shows, and they're like, "Man, we know that it, it would be so awesome to to hear a debate or a discussion." Yes, I totally agree with that, and we've we've laid it out there, but we're not the kind of people, and I, you know, uh, I guess we've done it before, but to say 
we're not the kind of people that go, we're going to go and attack an individual and rile up a bunch of drama. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then go online and, and make it's it about that style. and go, hey, everybody, guess what happened on Facebook? I had a really crazy argument with somebody. We rock them, sock them, robot it. Yeah, we rock them. <laughs> and it was great. Yeah, you know, but to sit there and say we would love to participate in events like this, we'd love to participate in uh, interviews, debates, appearances, you name it, Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. I'll tell you, man, this is important news, Joe, about Rents Priebus. Yes, I, I'm reading about it right now. Well, I'm t- <laughs> it's a big deal. Uh, Rents Priebus forced back into ancient puzzle box after being tricked into saying name backwards. This is actually something I was going back into the Wayback Machine. I've been seeing Priebus, his name's popping up, of course, all over the place because of his involvement with the administration. And there's a lot of uh, kind of conspiracies about, you know, is he connected to the the leakers that are, you know, trying oh, to right. hurt Trump and, and that he's really part of the establishment. I've seen it. I've seen it out there that he's peddling this. But it made me, I remembered. And I said, wait a second. Didn't that guy get put into a box? Yeah. Like, didn't he somehow years ago? Yes. So I go back and I go look and come to find out, lo and behold, right here, uh, startled sources at a GOP fundraiser confirmed that after being duped into saying his own name backwards, ancient elf and mischief maker and Republican <laughs> National Committee chairman, so this is a while ago, uh, Rens Priebus, was cast back into the gilded puzzle box that is confined to him for millennia. Yes, yeah. Fooled into saying his name backwards, as we all know. If uh, the old ancient elven rule of saying your name backwards puts you back into uh, the old uh, puzzle box. Yeah, previous a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all it took. These are facts, folks. These are facts. We don't lie. Not alternative. This is not fake news. Priebus, a wily mystical creature who has reportedly carried out right-wing political trickery at numerous points throughout recorded history, was said to be delivering a speech on traditional family values when he unthinkingly read the words so PR NCR aloud off the teleprompter, immediately causing the lights in the Omni Hotel to flicker and sending a powerful, chilling wind through the convention hall. Yes. And what he said, I and boy, that just sends goosebumps all over me, dude. Yes, and it, don't forget, folks, this was years. This happened years, years ago. ago. So yeah. he, he was sucked into this puzzle box, <laughs> and he did get out. He, he was able to get back out. His, his final words, dude, and I, I'm telling you, hairs on the back of my neck are just, oh. He said, oh, no, you tricked me. And then he said, uh, he said, no, not again. Mark my words. I'll be back. I'll come back to get all of you. I'll always come back. The world hasn't seen the last of Rents Priebus. Now, the article goes in to talk about how this works, and it involves, it requires for him to come back out of this box. It's going to require a young virgin boy. <laughs> okay. A young virgin boy. To basically rub this box and, and I think to just say his name three times and or something like it's that. It's like a Beetlejuice type thing. And he thing. comes out, yeah. Again, folks, these are all facts. So I'm saying, how is it that all of a sudden he just popped up? Where? Who is this point? I thought, Baron Trump. Baron Trump. Baron Trump. So we know. That, yeah. Yes, it started off as an Onion article. Yes, we know that sometimes the Onion does satire, but this is a fact. We know it to be true. <laughs> yeah. Baron Trump <laughs> rubbed a puzzle box and it brought yeah. Rents Priebus back. Uh, yeah, yes. it's a, it's a, he's at the heart of so many things, I think, Baron. I, I think that Baron is at the heart of a bunch of these kind of conspiracies, and everybody's afraid to kind of deal he's with it. He's the actual, he's the mastermind. He's the mastermind of this Baron whole Trump. plot. Yeah. He's, he's <laughs> the one that's doing it all. Yeah, speaking <laughs> of masterminds and, and, oh and master plots and everything else. Did you see, Joe, did you watch the segment with Maddo on the I, tax returns? I did you watch, watch it? I did not. I you didn't did not. watch I didn't watch the big quote unquote breaking news of Maddow's one and a half page of his tax returns. <laughs> it was amazing. I, I didn't you know to see the build up, to see a countdown clock. Oh yeah. They had a countdown clock. That's twenty four hour news all day, right? The it, countdown clock always. Did they always. see it? My assumption is that's what they did. I, I doubt that everyone in MSNBC got to have a look at it. I bet you that it was kept very tight to the chest all the way up until she delivered it. Let's give some background to it just so everyone sure. knows. Sure. So everybody's on the same page. Huh? Yeah. So Rachel Maddow takes conspiracy theorizing mainstream with a Trump tax return scoop. Um, this is by Sonny Bunch, executive editor of and film critic for Washington Free Beacon. And this was over at Washington Post, and it was another uh, – 
website mainstream that shared it as well. Yes. So basically, Rachel Maddow and her team, one way or another, got their hands on a leaked Trump tax return. And they and she wanted to talk about it, and it was his income from 2005. But when it was pitched, it was pitched to everybody that she had, like, a lot of information. She had Trump's tax returns, and people were very excited. They People were thinking, we're going to really get to the bottom of these business deals and financial leanings, um, and we're going we're gonna to see what happens there. So they got – she started it. She had her show. Do you remember exactly what day she did this? Uh, I don't remember exactly what day, but the buildup was amazing. The buildup and, and laying everything out and and getting people all pumped, the energy throughout the day, the other hosts throughout the day reminding everybody oh, about all of this and, and how it was the time was almost here for us to finally get it. And then they were told that we're going to have to simply hear more later, which unfortunately, because we're almost out of time for this segment, we got to say to the people listening to the show. Yes. We're, yeah, we got to let them know. <laughs> we we, we got to let you know we're almost out of, out of time for this segment. Yeah, we, can't, we, we can't actually break this down in this exact segment. Yeah, we only yeah. have like 30 seconds. Yeah, but we so. are going to be breaking it down. But boy, <laughs> there's a lot to it where right. basically um, <laughs> it did get to the level of conspiracy because of just all of the hoopla, the hullabaloo surrounding it, and how big they built it up for such little information. It knows nothing about what happened to Donald Trump the last decade. Small amount of information, but we are going to break it down. We're going to talk about it more. Stick around, Love folks. Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. Welcome back to Paleo Radio. We were talking about all sorts of things, political, economic, religious, anything you can think about, anything your little heart desires we talk about. Right now we're discussing the Trump campaign. We're discussing his tax returns and Rachel Maddow covering um, a very, very small portion of his tax returns, which was wow. um, really just kind of a big old flop, wasn't it? It kind of was. <clears throat> Excuse me for that. Oh, that my, my throat's been my throat's been killing me. I need one of those uh, special edition Paleo Radio cough drops. I, yes. I brought them the Paleo lozenges. <laughs> I I think I left them in the Paleo, paleo Jet. Lo- paleo yeah, the Paleo lozenges. lozenges are in the Paleo Jet. But you know the build up uh, for this was kind of like the build up for ours. I don't know if people put the uh, their two minute timer on when we went to break. Uh, for the countdown for when we would break this down. Yes. You know, but these uh it's all about coincidences, man. And listen, I I hate saying I hate saying this, but it's true is I I have friends that I greatly respect. And these these individuals that I greatly respect, um they they're sharing things in they're very zealous and they're very angry. And they're very hurt, and they're very scared, and it's very reasonable in many ways. But what it has, what it's done to them, they don't see. They don't. They don't recognize what has happened to them in what ways they have changed. And I'm watching it, and I'm saying I'm seeing people share stuff as as fact. That is is just – you can read it and it's like, man, this is seriously beautiful mind type stuff. Mm-hmm. And I love – and I care about these individuals and I'm just like, you know, I – it gets crazy. It gets to the point in, in this guy or, or Sonny Bunch I, and I, I feel badly. I don't know much about Sonny. But saying Maddow's coincidences pile up relentlessly, remorselessly. You sit there overwhelmed by it all, processing, trying to pick apart just why – this is nonsense, but having a tough time of it because every individual datum is accurate. And that's actually true. The, yeah. All the individual datum is actually accurate. But this is how conspiracy theorists operate. You bury your opponent in an avalanche of facts and suggest there's some secret connecting them all together, a Rosetta Stone, that you're on the verge of deciphering. That is how conspiracies work. Yeah. Yes. That's how Alex Jones, at least before his transformation into Rush Limbaugh 2.0, yeah. how he used to operate. Well, and whenever there's a huge gap, you just say it's a cover-up, and yeah. that clears your gap, right? Like, I think about it like the old cartoon of two different land 
two different like square areas of land and you have a big gap in between and conspiracy theories trying to get across there you just it's just making a little bridge oh the, you know there's no there's no ground supporting it but it was just it was a cover up and then they jump right to the next and i think that we're seeing it abound on all all sorts of all sorts of sides you know um i think we're seeing it all over the place because we kind of dance we dance back and forth i think on both on both party lines because as much as i think it is fully on conspiratorial to say that donald trump was working hand in hand with the russians during the election like that's conspiratorial right you know that's that's working off a lot of uh that's not working off a lot of information um it's going off of a couple things that loosely are connected to to make it you know it formulated into a, an idea i think it's the same way when people say things like the DNC killed people like Seth Rich. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's wildly conspiratorial as well. Yeah, you know, and I think that we it it goes on both those sides. Or to say that um, the CIA and the FBI and all of them are diverting our attention for some other reason, and they point to other false flags and say that's the reason why we don't trust it now. That's conspiratorial. That's I mean, individually taking it, it's hard to say now. Long story short, these groups are in the game of giving people false information. That's that's a fact. But what's going on with Rachel Maddow and what's going on with people saying the same thing about the FBI, I think is very similar in terms of there's a lot of gaps and there's a lot of filling it in with, well, it's a cover-up of epic proportion and we just don't know a lot about it. And we're getting that from all angles. We are. And that that's what is particularly troublesome to me. Is that before, you know, it used to just simply be right wing watch. I think now there should be maybe a left wing watch. Well, and let is. me take out the maybe. I think there, there should be should a left wing watch and there a right wing watch because I think it's getting crazy. Me too. But Matt, I'll, and I kind of like how the, this pull quote uh, that Sonny thought was a significant one uh, saying, quote, all right. The stated explanation here makes no sense. Talking about Trump's stated explanation uh, for money and taxes or why he's not releasing it. What's the real explanation? Well, Choose your own adventure. That is the end quote from Maddow. Uh, Sonny says this, And in that invocation of the seminal children's books from the 1980s and 90s, Maddow gives the game away. She stepped beyond the world of reporting and into the realm of speculation, one where random facts can be rejiggered in a way the storyteller likes. All that's missing is one key document, one clue to unraveling it all, In Maddow's case, the full tax returns that will prove everything. There's a certain appeal of this brand of thinking, as folks who dig InfoWars and similar outfits have long known. The conspiracy theorist loves to theorize, to postulate, to hypothesize and propose and presume. In so doing, the theorist can force the world to conform to her presuppositions. Yes. Yeah, I I think it's true. Thanks, uh, Glenn I, Becky, too. I don't just want to say this because as as I said, Infowars is is decreasingly interested in conspiracies. It seems. Well, now they d- they don't have any they don't. conspiracies. Now, yeah, now, now they, they just the, go to the White well, House and, and get exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and because now the establishment is the one they like, so they're doing all the right things. They're good people now. Yeah, they they straight good guy bad guy it like crazy. <laughs> um. But you're right. This whole, the whole thing about taking the conspiracy when she says choose your own adventure. Yes, that takes you way out. Now, I do think getting his full tax return would solve a lot of these issues. You know, and I do think that there are issues. Here's this is one where it's not conspiratorial to say that there's a big problem with conflict of interest that Donald Trump hasn't put a blind trust in his assets and doesn't show us his tax return. Mm-hmm. That's not even conspiracy to say that there's questions there. Um so you could get the answers, but I think that this he is exactly right about the choose when she says choose your own adventure. That's just a that's a dangerous way of. But of that's playing. what people are doing, you know. And this is it. It reminded me, and this is something I saw in a different story. But uh, Alex Pfeiffer was reporting, saying that reminding people of the New York Times article. Uh, that was saying Donald Trump tax records show he could have avoided taxes for nearly two decades. Now, the way that's worded, it, 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 Alex Pfeiffer, the way they worded it over where they published that was was that the New York Times lied. By the sound of that, I don't think it's that the New York Times lied. 
It's just simply that they cast the speculation saying that he could, it's a possibility that he paid none. What they ended up finding was he ended up paying, he, he pays more, less than the Clintons. The Clintons are like 34 point some odd percent, right? Yes. But he pays yes. more than Obama and he pays more that year. That he year. He paid more than Obama and more than Bernie Sanders. Yes. But less less than Hillary. He paid like 20, was like 24 percent. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it, in fact, it's respectable. Made, I mean, that's it's more than what? It's, I think it's more than Mitt Romney. It is. And it's, and it's no. pre-Donald Trump uh, market crash and bankruptcy. Yeah, but they were saying there was a – in 2005 for him, that was actually a, a rough time of it, that he could have actually benefited from this. And I I don't know. I'd want to – I'd want to – Well, and, and also there's – He the made $150 million in income. Yes. No. And and I think $30 million in taxes or something. Yeah, now, $38 million. We, we get back into the uh, the conspiracies again of people – some people have been saying that the Donald Trump campaign leaked it. Yeah. I mean that's that's what I'm talking about by just absence of evidence – speculation of wild proportion what is wrong with just saying you don't know you know or say i don't i don't know we don't have enough evidence but i think that would get that would just take us so much further you have to put that addendum in there that says i don't really know this for a fact but i'm speculating if you don't then this is just wild it is wild conspiracy theory abound all of this is i yeah uh, uh, do you think some of it is Predicated upon the nature of the person that we have in the office. Yes. I think part of it's that. I mean, look, what was the situation where there was a speculation? In fact, the person who said that it was released, the person who said there was only two individuals with the document, it would be Trump and her, was saying that Trump released it under the name of somebody else, that he basically was pretending to be somebody else releasing documents about himself. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah he that he was, pretended he, to be his own PR guy once. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, so that's in the pool. Yeah. So people I didn't can even think about so that, people yeah. can say, well, hey, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of how do you know? But the thing is we just don't right now. That's right. That's why having a a full release of his most current like last 2 or 3 years of tax returns would be really sufficient or just the last year basically just i'm asking that he be held to the same standard that many of our presidents in the last what since 1970 have been held in and especially when yes for america's history i've heard the argument that republicans lay out or conservatives that say well you know presidents haven't done that through all of history i totally agree globalization hasn't really kicked in until the 1990s so i'm really happy that since then presidents have shown their tax returns no, it's it's really that easy for me. Is I that think it's easier to funnel and, and hide money today than it's ever been. So you need to know now. I think one of the one of the reasons why this is prevailing is because we're talking about and, and, and I, I don't want to say that Maddow doesn't believe what she's saying. Right. I believe that she's genuinely believing all of the things that she's saying right now um, at the same time. There's a commercial interest here. You have an audience, and that audience of people, they're very angry. And in fact, they're so angry that it's concerning some people. And that's actually another article we can t- we're going to talk about, it, about Russia. Uh, Glenn Greenwald talking about quoting key Democratic officials over the last week that have been coming out and kind of warning, warning people, dampening down expectations on what they think you're going to find – uh, or what is going to be presented? And today, by the way, Comey's, uh he's actually speaking before Congress today. Yeah, he's going to let them know if they're investigating, right? Yeah, I think, well, he's going to be talking to them. But there's, so you have people come out and they're, they're saying, listen, there's, from what we've seen, the, there's two illegal things that, that have happened. Number one is that uh, somebody uh, got the information, hacked into uh, the DNC. Okay, that's number one. Number two uh, is that people have been uh, releasing information uh, about the Trump administration since we've been in. Apart from those two things, and these are lead people. We'll talk more about that when we come back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. 
Welcome back to Paleo Radio, live, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, 102.5 FM as well, 90.1 as well. Boy, we just are racking up the stations. Yeah, we're all over the place, racking up radio stations left and right, uh, passing out good times like candy out the back of a float at a parade. Yes. Which, you know, hey, man, we had, we had St. Patrick's Day recently. And yeah, that was so St. Patty's. Yeah, do, what, did you do anything fun for St. Patrick's Day? Uh, no. Yeah, I didn't. I, well, I hung out with one of my good friends. So, yeah, I mean, that was fun, but I didn't do anything wild. Yeah, crazy. I didn't do anything festive or anything like that. I did share that one meme, which I'm still not sure if it's real or if it's a joke, talking about ending St. Patrick's Day uh, because of privilege. Oh, no, I didn't see and ex- that. And ex- exclusivism and that it's, it's uh, white nationalism and that we can't have anything like that. And there was an interesting debate that took place on... On the Facebook wall over that one, I said I was having a hard time reading uh, that that meme through the bottom of all the glasses of uh, empty Bloody Marys and green beer that yes. I've been drinking throughout the day. Yes, I well, said I was having a hard time. I yeah, can't see it. I also think too that I don't know. I honestly think that St. Patty's Day. This we don't have to get into this too much, but I think that St. Patty's Day is a celebration of the worst stereotypes about white Irish people that you can possibly get. People dress up with leprechaun outfits and buckled shoes, talk about pots of gold and get hammered drunk because that's what Irish people do. It's the same thing as it. It's no better. It is no better than Donald Trump's uh, little bowl on Cinco de Mayo. His his uh, his little taco bowl. It's the same thing. Is like you're you're celebrating some of the most stereotypical portions of a society, but it, I can't really see how it would be part of the patriarchy to celebrate white drunkenness. To celebrate white drunkenness, unless and not and not everybody celebrates white drunkenness. People got to remember it's a feast day. You know, St. Patrick's Day is on calendars all over the place, but it's a, it's a liturgical feast day, and so there are a people. Uh, faithful, devout people all across the world. And in fact, the religion, the Catholic religion is what, predominantly black and brown? is not yes. even a predominantly white religion, right? And so there's tons of people from different races that celebrate and honor this particular uh, saint and many other saints in the liturgical uh, feast year that don't do the revelry, kind of like Corpus Christi. Yes. You know, and other other uh, carnivals, right? Like, j- just because Fat Tuesday, you know, not everybody who celebrates it. And it kind of reminds me, the debate around that kind of reminds me of Christmas. A little bit, yeah. A little bit, you know, the exclusivity of it. I'm like, it's not really exclusive. I mean, I you don't have to believe in, you know, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Caucasian baby Jesus to— to like Christmas, to celebrate it, sure. you can still celebrate it and not have that. You know, Macaulay Culkin under your you know <laughs> nativity stuff. You don't have to have that, and so you can still celebrate Christmas. But you're going to have the people who say, you know what? Look at the abuses of Christmas. Look at the terrible things. You know, it's it's just meant to be gifts with family, and now look at it. It's just commercial commercialization. And there's a point to all of it, but I feel like some of that's kind of the same with St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm like, well, yeah, there's there's excessive things. It's American. You're talking the American uh, expression of this. Yes. It, yeah, we basically taken anything that used to be sacred to some people or still is, and we've just commodified it. We turn it into a drunken mess. <laughs> yeah. That's what we do. Because it's America. Because America. Because America. And, you know, we were talking in the last segment. About, you know, why is it and why is it that a lot of people on the left that they are kind of falling for a lot of these conspiracies or at least not falling for conspiracies, but falling for the way of thinking that that says I don't demand my threshold for evidence is much lower. Anecdotes mean a lot more. Anonymous, unverifiable claims mean a lot more. Um, All these things that used to be kind of down and deprioritized because of the nature of them, they're no longer deprioritized. Mm-hmm. In some cases, that may be the only thing that they're relying on. Mm-hmm. And so it's a real problem. Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, he talks about it over at The Intercept. He says, key Democratic officials now warning base not to expect evidence of Trump-Russia collusion. He, uh, the principal problem for Democrats is that so many media figures and online charlatans are personally benefiting from feeding the base increasingly unhinged 
fact-free conspiracies, just as right-wing media polemicists did after both Bill Clinton and Obama were elected. That there are now millions of partisan soldiers absolutely convinced of a Trump-Russia conspiracy for which, at least as of now, there's no evidence. And they are all waiting for the day which they regard as inevitable and imminent when this theory will be proven and Trump will be removed. And I, I, I want to clarify again that when it says convinced of a Trump-Russia conspiracy, what he's talking about is the collusion, direct collusion between yes. the two of them. Not that, not, that Trump, not that Russia didn't have a preference or that Russia didn't, uh, didn't, hack. didn't hack the election. Yeah that's, yeah, that's not what he's talking about. He's specifically saying when talking about the collusion between Trump and the idea that Putin is working with them and they're talking mm-hmm. and that kind of a thing. He says key Democratic officials are clearly worried, and I, I wouldn't put clearly, but worried about the expectations that have been purposely stoked uh, and are now trying to tamp them down. Many of them have tried to signal that the beliefs the base has been led to adopt have no basis in reason or evidence. Yes. Well, and and I think that – it's an interesting it's an interesting angle to be taking on it too like i mean i totally understand i guess where i want to go with this is saying that glenn greenwald is dancing an interesting game though too by saying that there's when he says no evidence or no idea of the collusion being specific is what matters like why why do people assume it well because the same administration denied the chances that russia hacked it and the evidence has shown that they did so there's it, – it's – a lot of it has to do with the behavior of the group. For instance, let's say, let's say the Republican Party said there's a chance that Russia, Russia hacked the election. We're going to take this – we're going to actually take that information and we'll give you everything we have and let you know – let you see. You know, we, we'll show everything that we have or we can prove definitively that it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they didn't – take that angle they took the route of none of this is real it's all fake well and then you force the intelligence agency to come out and say something the agency does come out and say something and they say what they say is fake mm-hmm. and now we're finally to the point of we're adopting this but now we're in now we're talking about denying it all i'm trying to say is if you lay this out i don't think that i can understand why people get into this conspiratorial fervor because there is no difference the establishment that's being accused is their position is not any different on this than it was about Russians hacking them, which they have been, they were wrong about. And so people don't trust them. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think it's based in, it's not based in fact. It, but they don't trust them. But they don't trust them. Yeah. Well, and they're doing a good job of making themselves not trustworthy. Totally. You know. And you've got, you've got Obama's former acting CIA chief, Michael Morell. Uh, what makes him particularly notable, and this is the article here, this is Greenwald, in this context is that Morrell was one of Clinton's most vocal CIA surrogates. He's the first high official to explicitly accuse Trump of disloyalty. He claimed, quote, in the intelligence business, we would say that Mr. Putin had recruited Mr. Trump as an unwitting agent of the Russian Federation. But on Wednesday night, Morrell appeared at an intelligence community forum to cast doubt, and that's in quotation marks, on, quote, allegations that members of the Trump uh, campaign colluded with Russia. And he goes on to say this. This is uh, talking about Morell. On the question of the Trump campaign conspiring with the Russians here, there's smoke, but there's no fire at all. There's no little campfire. There's no little candle. There's no spark. And there's a lot of people looking for it. That's right. Yeah. And he cast out on, on the dossier. As well, but we've already, yeah, we talked about that. But mm-hmm. he's he's saying there's nothing. James Clapper, he told Meet the, Meet the Press last week uh, that that he saw no evidence to support claims of a Trump Russia conspiracy. He says, and this is a direct quote: "We had no we had no evidence of such collusion." Yes, yes, and so that. But again, specific claim. Isolate this claim. Well, and that's right. this is the thing: is just as wrong as we have to loop the the right wing nutbird into this though too. Is you can't say we can't be, and I this is not what you're doing, Jeremiah. But I'm talking about conservatives that say, look, James Clapper just said there's no connection. James Clapper also said Russia hacked the election. Mm-hmm. So he we can't. <laughs> what he said is either we either are trusting the evidence that James Clapper has, or we're denying it. But we can't say he's right about one and he's wrong about the other. I, I think James oh, Clapper's right about both. both. I yeah, think Russia could. hacked the election. I think Donald Trump is yeah. an unwitting part, 
unwitting participant in what happened. And I think there is no collusion between Russia and Trump directly. Senate Intelligence Committee, they recently told BuzzFeed uh, how petrified they are of what the Democratic base will do if they do not find evidence of collusion, as they now suspect will likely be the case. That's, this is crazy. Quote, there's a tangible frustration over what one official called wildly inflated expectations surrounding the panel's fledgling investigation going on. Several committee sources grudgingly say it feels as though the investigation will be seen as a sham if the Senate doesn't find a silver bullet connecting Trump and Russian intelligent operatives. It will be seen as a sham. It will be. Just in the same way that it was seen as a sham, uh, the 9-11 report. Yeah. Well, actually, no, let me pull back. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it. I think that they have a natural – the committee, if they looked into this and found nothing, did the right thing. You, they, what is, why would they not investigate this? Why, they know that Russia hacked the election. That's, that's, we can put this in the, that in the fact category at this point. Russia hacked the DNC. We can't, I mean, let's, let's not split hairs. That's what, if we're going with what we're saying here about the intelligence community saying there's no evidence there, then we'll go with what the intelligence community said about hacking. I think it's a plausible – if we're talking about reason, that's a reasonable thing to do. It's a, it's, it's a, a possible thing. I mean you, there could be arguments that you could – somebody could say, well, what would be the reason for him saying that there's none – there's no evidence when he's already come out? He's basically taking it on the chin that's what in I'm one saying. scenario. In the other, there is something to benefit from saying – someone can make that argument. There is something to benefit uh, from saying that there was a connection back during a time when it was highly contentious. But, I mean, for who? For for the person he endorsed. Well, I guess, no, we're talking Clapper. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you, you, know, if you add uh, what was said by Michael Morell, if you add that, I mean, he, that's a person who, he had a lot on the line. He said this in defense as a surrogate. Yes. You know, to go out and say this kind of stuff and then to pull it back and say, hey, we, yeah. we don't have that. That's actually kind of a big admission a little bit but on I, talking points during a campaign. Yes. Well, but I just think that we look at the intelligence community and we say they either have the evidence to know these things or they don't. If we don't think they do, then nothing they say is worth it. If we believe that they, well, I mean, if they if they don't have the evidence, then why would we even trust what they say? If they do have the evidence, then we need to go with what they go with. Stick around, folks. We'll be right back. Paleo Radio. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. Get your background briefing Monday through Fridays at 7 a.m. on Public Reality Radio, WPRR, 1680 a.m. and 95.3 FM. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. I want to give another shout out to T-Bear, the most amazing seven-year-old girl in the world. I totally flubbed the intro to the show, Joe. Oh, that's okay. I did. It was hilarious. I said seven years old, and then my wife is shaking her head at me from over in the call room, and I'm like, (laughs) what? So I'm just thinking, well, you know, wives are always right. Yes. So I go, "Ah, eight. You know, we got, man, we've had four kids. Trust me, ages start to kind of get crazy. Yes. Dates, ages, everything else. And you're like, oh. It all comes but together. But I'll tell you, Teresa is an amazing human being. I love her with all of my heart. She's, she is the, one of the, the coolest and most loving divas I've ever known. <laughs> but she's totally a diva. She's like Punky Brewster. She's got awesome style. She loves to draw. She loves playing with babies and dolls and a, a very girly girl. But also, you know, very athletic, mm-hmm. loves playing with the boys. Found out uh, two days ago she weighs the same as her older brother, Athen. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, you know, three years her, her elder, yeah. uh, same height, same weight. Wow. So she's, she's, just, she's a force to be reckoned with. I love her with all of my heart. And, of course, I wish her a happy birthday. Yeah. Um, water, bro. Water is America's number one drink. Water is America's Bottled number water. one drink. Are you are you surprised? 
I am. I am too a little bit. I am surprised. I'm surprised that uh, the America's number one drink is water. It's 20, always been soda for years. Twenty-one billion dollars on bottled water. Bottled water. The stuff we were getting out of our tap. Yep. You Think know about G- that game. G.K. Chesterton wrote many a year ago uh, that that the world would be insane. You, you would know. It's kind of the threshold, the the red line of insanity if we started paying for bottled water. If we started paying for it being bottled, yeah, or anything like that, it happened so fast we didn't even really realize it. Didn't even realize it, but we spent twenty-one billion dollars last year. Yeah, that is just absolutely amazing. Euromonitor found it's an in- industry research group. Bottled water consumption in the U.S. hit thirty-nine point three gallons per capita last year. Good heaven! Wow. While carbonated soft drinks fell to thirty-eight point five. So yes. almost a whole, yeah, almost yeah. a whole gallon. And that marks the first time that soda was knocked off the top spot. Mm-hmm. And this is according to data from industry tracker Beverage Marketing Corp, like we were talking about. Unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. More than one quarter of bottled water revenue last year was shared by the soda giants Coca-Cola, right, company, and PepsiCo. Wow. So more than a quarter of bottled water. That's wild. Right? They sell Dasani and Aquafina, respectively, right, which are garbage. In the four yes. decades since the launch of Perrier water uh, in the U.S., it's, consumption. It's Perrier. Perrier. I am so, I apologize. I only know that because they're in my hometown digging up and ransacking my, my hometown. So and it's, I know it's spelled fancy. It, it, you know what? It looks like it would be uh, oh, yeah. pronounced Fan, that way. Fancy, fancy schmancy. Perrier. Fancy schmancy from your town. Okay. So, you know, from the U.S., consumption of bottled water surged 2,700%. From 354 million gallons in 1976 to 11.7 billion in 2015. Wow. Absolutely amazing, man. That's just mind blowing. You know, there's a book, Bottled and Sold The Story Behind Our Obsession with Bottled Water, saying some 45% of bottled water brands are sourced from the municipal water supply. So think about that. Yeah. That's, he- whoa. That's, that is worth breaking down. I like down my again. container. Some 45% of bottled water brands are sourced from the municipal water supply, the same source as what comes out of the tap. So they're literally – put a Purina tap on your, on your filter, on your faucet, and that's it. That's all you need to do to have it at home. There's no need to be doing this, folks. Unbelievable. Yeah, another thing, man, that we may not have to be doing, and we're not entirely sure, is spending so much time with smartphones. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Smartphones. Yeah. Smartphones may be changing the way we think. Those attention-grabbing digital devices are like a new appendage. How are they changing us? By Laura Sanders at sciencenews.org. Yeah. Interesting they would say that, too, that it would be an extra appendage because in, com- yeah. in communication theory, we know someone who talks an awful lot about yeah. uh, technology being an, an extension of themselves. So that that is an interesting Marshall thing. McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So going into the article, it says, Not too long ago, the internet was stationary. Most often, we'd browse from the web from a desktop computer in our living room or office. Oh, my gosh. If we were feeling really adventurous, maybe we'd cart our laptop to a coffee shop. <laughs> Looking back, those days seem quaint. Yeah. Today, the internet moves through our lives with us. We hunt Pokemon as we shuffle down the sidewalk. We text at red lights. We tweet from the bathroom. We slip a smartphone or we sleep with a smartphone within arm's reach, using the device as both lullaby and alarm clock. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we put our phones down while we eat, but usually face up just in case something important happens. Like a Facebook notification. You bet. Boy, somebody liked it. That little shot of dopamine, that little quick shot that we all love. I'm serious. Oh, true. It's huge. You know, I did a video. I don't know if I ever talked about this before, but I, I did a video. A friend of mine, we used to make these skits all the time, and it was about how people would text me. And this was true, where I would, I would be distracted all the time. I'd be in the middle of a conversation, and my phone would vibrate. And the person would be telling me something real personal, and I'd look over at my phone. Yep, and, and be like, hold on, hold on, i got to take this real quick. And sometimes it'd be ridiculous, so we made this, this skit um, called, uh, I forget what it's called, but anyway, uh, where I'm, I'm looking at this, and the person that's trying to talk to me about this personal thing is increasingly getting angry about it. And eventually s- smacks me in the face, claws me. I, it's, it's a rather hilarious thing. Yes. But this is for real. I mean, I, how many times do you go to a restaurant and you see a family where everybody's on their smartphone and All nobody's the time. talking? Yeah. All the time. Unbelievable. And, you know, and, and this is to be noted, too. 
in ni- in a nineteen twenties railway cart, no one was sitting there talking to their neighbor either. They were all sitting there with a newspaper in their face. So it's, it's not to say that society as itself right. has become more antisocial. I just don't. I truly do not believe that. I think that. I, I think in many settings where people were awkwardly forced into social situations, they have the option of not going into them. And in some cases, I don't know if that's actually that bad. You know, the guy at the bar, think about how awkward people feel if they sat at a bar, went to a bar alone, were waiting for a friend to get there and didn't have their phone. And they had to sit with their hands folded, just looking around the room, engaging the room. Derp, derp, derp. You know, it, are we really losing on social connectivity to have that? To say that that guy should be sitting there just looking around the room and said on his phone? No, you're losing nothing. You're losing nothing. That guy's not. Yeah, somewhat limited, occasionally contradictory findings illustrate how science has struggled to pin down this slippery, fast-moving phenomenon. Laboratory, laboratory studies hint that technology and its constant interruptions may, and there's a list of these, and I encourage everybody to go check it out, but change our thinking strategies, right? So these constant interruptions can actually change the way that we think, right? And it lists this. Like our husbands and wives, our devices have become memory partners. And this, I I guess I didn't even really think too much about that, allowing us to dump information there and forget about it. Yes. In offloading that comes with benefits and drawbacks. They they talk about uh, navigational strategies maybe shifting, about how how we find our place in the world. Where we situate ourselves within the world, that this has changed. Um, they talk about constant interactions with technology may even raise anxiety uh, in certain settings. Totally true. Absolutely true. Totally, totally true. Look, yes. at, I mean, yeah, this is this has been on on big time display now for I don't know, year and a half, two years. Let's call it two. Let's say two years now. We have seen it, 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 a huge level. We have seen how social media can create massive amounts of anxiety. Yes, and and anxiety of just the um, what is it? Uh, fear of missing out, FOMO, mm-hmm. F O M O. That that that's a real thing that people oftentimes are even checking their social media not to just check their own notifications, but to see if their friends have done anything that they they miss out on. You know what I mean? That that is a natural state of anxiety you know and this is one thing i can say too is the media is an extension of ourselves but it doesn't hurt to have a few times that are planned no me no media time where you basically say like i'm gonna go take my dog for a walk and i'm gonna leave my phone in the house you know and a lot of people well what if you get in an accident well everyone else is walking around with their phone i would i can trust very calmly that everyone else walking around isn't going to do the same thing but point being Take that time to have some scheduled time without it, and you'd be amazed the level of anxiety that can go down from it just from the fact of how often you're reaching for it to check what's going on, what right. am I missing. That's Has what they said. said. They said in diabolical experiments, and it, when he first put – or when uh, the writer, I'm sorry. When, when the writer put in diabolical experiments, I'm like, diabolical? Like what, yes. what, how bad could it be? Oh, you judge for yourself. Cal State's Rosen takes college students' phones away under the ruse that the devices are interfering with laboratory measurements of stress, such as heart rate and sweating. The phones are left on, but placed out of reach of the students who are reading a passage. Then the the researchers start texting the students, who are forced to listen to the dings without being able to see the messages or respond. Uh. Measurements of anxiety spike, Rosen has found, and reading comprehension dwindles. Absolutely, because they're not focused. They're absolutely focused Mm. on their phone. And then they said other experiments have found that heavy technology users last about 10 minutes without their phones before showing signs of anxiety. Yes. Wow. And who isn't a heavy technology user? At this user? point. I, listen, That's a millennial. I, leave, I leave it away. I, I won't even bring it to bed anymore. I put it away from me. Uh, I, I Same thing with my computer. And I've been reading at night for hours yes. before I even go to bed. I'm talking two hours before I even go to bed. I'll try to do this. Not perfect about it, but mm-hmm. I'll try. And I have found that I'm able to sleep better. No phone? My Fitbit is no phone by the what bed. What about computer? <laughs> No computer by the bed. There you go. No screen time by the bed. No screens no in the TV bedroom. No TV in the bedroom. No, 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 no screens nothing. in the bedroom. That's yeah. the way it should be. 
All right, folks. Thank you guys very much for listening to another dynamic, jam-packed episode yeah, of Pandy Radio. We over. much, much love and we appreciate it. Yeah. Make sure find out more about us. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash paleo radio. Go to paleo radio uh, at Secular Media Group. You can find us there. And, of course, on Spreaker, on iTunes, on Twitter, everywhere else. Paleo Radio. We're verified. Yes. Thank you guys very much for listening. We will see you next week. Have a good one.